Thank you, Randy. Wasn't that great? Man, I love the music today, the set that the guys have been singing, and Randy, the song that you sang. And, and the title of that song, I Choose Jesus. Just keep that in mind as we go through the message today. I don't know about you, but I think we got a little rowdy today. I kind of like getting rowdy, don't you? I'm not sure in very many Baptist churches we ever get real rowdy. But I want to tell you something. We're getting ready to go into a new year. And as we go into a new year, I like to think about being excited about the things of God. And just about choosing Jesus and living for Him. And to see the excitement that there is as we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can put this year, 2014, behind us, and we can look to 2015. I don't know about you, but I'm excited for my life in 2015. I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what God has in store for me. I don't know what God has in store for our church. But uh, looking at this crowd here on this day, the last Sunday of December, I think God has a lot in store for us at Glenville Church. I'm so thankful for Pastor giving me the opportunity to speak, and um, I appreciate him so much. You know, he and I really don't have a lot of things in common, except we just really appreciate each other and like to be with each other and, and uh, talk about uh, church work and theology, and once in a while we throw golf in there, but usually it's theology most of the time. But I really appreciate uh, what he allows me to do here at uh, Glenville. And I also would like to take just a moment to thank each and every one of you for purchasing one of the books that we had a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago. And um, I really appreciate that you supported me in that endeavor. And I pray that you're reading the book. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'd make a suggestion. If you have read it, I think I would go back and read it one more time. There is some life-changing information in that book. And I'd really encourage you to do so because oftentimes I'll pick up a book and I'll read it and I'll think, I don't know what that was all about. And then maybe later on I'll pick up that same book, I'll go back and read what was in that book, and I'll say, wow, now I understand what that author was talking about. But I did want to thank you for supporting me in that endeavor. The title of the message today is A Winning Attitude. And I think that's something that every one of us should have. That doesn't mean that everything in life is going to be just great. Doesn't mean everything in the spiritual life is going to be like it should be. But I think we ought to have an attitude. And sometimes I find myself having to have an attitude adjustment. As a matter of fact, this past week I just had to do that. I just had to get off of the Lord. Uh, some things were going on and, and uh, inside. And I thought, you know, that isn't what I want for my life. This is Christmas time. You're supposed to be excited. And so I had to adjust my attitude just a little bit. So I want to talk about a winning attitude. I believe that we can achieve whatever we can achieve in our life that God wants for us to have. I believe that God allows us to achieve what he wants for our life. Now, oftentimes we have to realize that we must make the right choices to achieve what God would have for us. Now, it's interesting at the end of this year, this is always a good time to put things behind us and look forward to something new. We're getting ready in just a few days to enter into January. January was named after the Roman god Janus. I put a picture of him up here. He's known as the two-faced god, the Roman god Janus, January. He has one face that's looking to the back, looking to the past, see what's back there. And he has another face looking forward. And so January is a good time to take off that Janus face that looks to the back, to maybe all of the problems that we had last year. Although it wasn't all problems, we had some successes and some peaks and pinnacles. But uh, if we're not careful, we would continue to look backward instead of forward to what God has for us in the future. The possibilities that God has for us, anticipate the excitement that he has for us. And so we have to take off that Janus face that looks to the back and look forward. Complacency. I read an article recently said this about complacency, and I want to read it to you and listen to it carefully. Complacency is a blight that saps energy, dulls attitude, and causes a drain on the brain. 
The first symptom is satisfaction with things as they are. The second is rejection of those as they might be. Good enough becomes today's watchword and tomorrow's standard. It's just good enough, good enough. I don't think we ever want to find our place, our life in a place where it's just good enough. Complacency. It goes on and says complacency makes people fear the unknown, mistrust the untried, and abhor the new. Like water, complacent people follow the easiest course downhill. They draw false strength from looking back. And oftentimes we get addicted to where we're at at the present time. We enjoy that. We get addicted to this moment, what's happening in my life at the present time. But Christianity is never something that just stays in one place. Christianity is something that moves forward, moves forward in our lives. Think of the different statements in the Bible. Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. That's not complacency. That's not being addicted to complacency. That is moving forward. Faith to faith, faith to faith. That is something that is moving. It's not stationary. From glory to glory, from glory to glory, you read the Bible and it's constantly moving, going forward. No complacency. And the problem, we get addicted to where we're living today. And the Apostle Paul, man that was in prison when he was writing the book of Philippians, and I'm going to read the scripture here in just a few moments. Here was a man that was in prison. This is a book, the book of Philippians, known as the book of joy, the book of rejoicing. I'm going to have Neil put the scripture from Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 8 through 14. I don't want to read this. I want you to follow along. Please watch the screen and listen to what the Apostle Paul, a man in prison, Roman prison, under house arrest, this is what he's saying. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to be apprehended, but this one thing, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. The face of Janus that looks back, that are behind, forgetting those things and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so there he is. Here's a man that has a winning attitude. I'm going somewhere. What do you mean you're going somewhere? You're sitting in prison. It's not enjoyable. Ah, oh, but you need to rejoice in the Lord. Wait a minute, you're in prison. You have guards around you. What are you talking about? But he had a winning attitude. You see, sometimes we, uh, we get on the treadmill of life. How many of you, starting January the 1st, are going to get on the treadmill and do your exercising? Any of you decided to do that? There you go. I, I don't see any adults. One kid right over here. There's one right back there. I see that. Anybody else? All oh, right over here. Treadmill. Okay. Well, the problem with the treadmill, and it's, it's good exercise because I use the treadmill. It's good exercise. But the treadmill of life, 
here's the problem with it. You don't go anywhere. You're just on the treadmill. A lot of activity taking place. But we're not making headway. We're not moving forward. Sometimes we get on that treadmill of life, complacency. And so I want to talk about some things that they will move us forward. The fact of it is, sometimes we're on a merry-go-round. You ever been on a merry-go-round? Now what happens as Christians, we, uh, we sometimes we get off and we get on a we get on another pony and we start riding another pony. You ever been on a merry-go-round? You get on a pony and or you put your grandkids on this pony and that pony. And sometimes in our Christian life, we're on the merry-go-round of our spiritual life. And we say, well, you know, I'm a little tired of this over here. I think I'll just change. I may, um, may start reading my Bible in January. I may start going to church more. I may start giving. I may even uh, sing different songs. I may even go to another church or something like that. And so what happens, we get off one pony and we get on the other pony. But the only problem with that, we're still on the same merry-go-round. We're not going anywhere, just going around and around. So we have to get off the ponies. We have to get off the merry-go-round. And we have to try something just a little bit different. So let me go through the, uh, the notes in your uh, bulletin this morning. And, and let's see exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he talks about a winning attitude in his life. Notice in verse number 8, chapter number 3, Philippians, yea, Doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, but I win Christ. That I might win Christ. That was his one desire, was to win Christ. And the question is, what do I value most in my life? What do I value most in my life for the coming year? The Apostle Paul considered Christ something worth winning. I love to watch the Olympics every year. And I love to watch the guys and the gals get up on the stands and they receive that gold medal and they hold it up. I won this gold medal. I won this silver medal, whatever it is, the bronze medal. I like to watch sometimes the Oscars and they hold the Oscar up and say, I won this Oscar, or sometimes the Emmy Award, whatever it might be. I was watching television the other day, and, and uh, Marcus Mariota won the uh, Heisman Trophy, 25-pound trophy. And I saw this guy holding it. He wasn't holding up one hand. He had it in both hands. I won this trophy, the Heisman Trophy. I won this trophy. Well, the Apostle Paul was saying, and I would encourage all of us here today to say of all of the things in my life I value most is for me to be able to say, I hold up Jesus Christ, that I might win him, that he is my trophy for 2015. That was his desire, sitting in prison, rejoicing. But the one thing that he wanted was to win Christ, that I might win him. He considered that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ as something so valuable. The Bible said, what would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his soul? Maybe you're here today. And when it comes to Christianity, it's all new to you. Maybe you're around people that talk about Christianity and you listen you're trying to figure out what is it all about. But maybe there's never been a time in your life when you realize that you do need Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Maybe it's a time in your life, you may be here today and you say, you know, I'm missing something. I don't have that trophy to hold up the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm missing something. And I would encourage you today to start the new year out just right. That if you've never, never come to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you of your sin and receive him into your life as your personal Savior, I'd encourage you to think about doing that today. It'll make your year so much better next year. And you too, can say, I have this trophy, the Lord Jesus Christ.
that I might win him. In verse 6 and 7 of that chapter, I don't have enough time to go through all the things that the Apostle Paul said. This is what my life used to be. This is what I used to hold up. But now I hold up Jesus Christ. The second thing that he said, not only that he might win Christ, but in verse number 9, that I may win Christ and be found in him. That I might be found in him. Think about that. That I might be found in Jesus Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but I, that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may be found in Jesus Christ. The question to that is, what do I hide behind when God is seeking me? What do I hide behind when God is seeking me? That I might be found in him. What does that mean, that I might be found in him? It's an interesting statement that he says, that I might win Christ, that I may be found in him. Well, the word found has a couple of different ideas behind it. One of those ideas is the fact that something has been discovered. That I have been found in Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought about the things that sometimes we hide behind? I might be found. See, I, I hide behind things. Have you ever hidden behind things afraid that maybe God's going to really see you for what you are? Sometimes we hide behind our jobs. I said, well, you know, I'm just going to stay in this office. I'm just going to stay at this workplace because I'm just a little bit afraid of what's going to happen out there. But sometimes we hide behind our families. And there's oftentimes we hide, we hide behind our addictions. And God's looking for us. He's constantly seeking us. And we hide from him. You remember the story in the Garden of Eden? Let me read it to you, Genesis chapter 3. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. And the Lord God called it Adam and said unto him, Adam, where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And I don't know how many times in my own personal life, especially early in my Christian life, I hid from God. But the Apostle Paul says, I don't want to hide. I want to be transparent. When God searches for me, it's okay. This is where I'm at. I want to be found in him. And so oftentimes it's discovery. But sometimes the word found is used as the foundation of something, which I think the Apostle Paul is probably talking about here as well. That I might have the basis of foundation, that I might have something to stand on for 2015, that I might be found in Him, to be found in His righteousness and not my own righteousness that I might win Christ, that I might be found in him. The third thing the Apostle Paul is saying, sitting in prison, that I might know him, that I might know him, that I may know him and the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of the suffering being made conformable unto his death. The question here is, how do I move from knowledge to experience? How do I move from knowledge to experience? The Greek word that he uses here is talking about personal knowledge. He's not talking about intellectual knowledge. Most of us have more intellectual knowledge than maybe we ever need to know. But how do you bring it into experience? How do you make it personal? When I first met my wife, I knew her intellectually. When I was 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, down there, we'll forget that time. I, uh, I went to Valley Center High School and, you know, wasn't much into girls and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, the only girls I ever had, they jilted me. 
And when I was in the Army, I got a Dear John letter. You ever got one of those? A Dear John letter, and you're in the Army. You don't like the Army anyhow. Then you get a Dear John letter. Then my wife, I met her. Man, I'll tell you what. I had every guy in high school jealous of me when I met her. I knew her. But I didn't really know her. And so now that we've been married 56 years, experiential knowledge, now I know her. Okay? Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about knowing Christ. Uh, we read a lot about Christ, God. We have intellectual knowledge about Him, about the universe, about mankind, about sin. But how do we bring that down into everyday living? How do we experience that? As a matter of fact, in that same verse, the Apostle Paul said that I might experience the resurrection power. Think about that. A power that can take someone that is dead and bring about a life. That I might know him and the power of the resurrection. I want to experience it. I don't want just intellectual knowledge about God. I want to know what God can do for my life. I want to know what God can do for my marriage. And how can I experience that, that power, that resurrection power in my marriage with my wife? How can I do that? And so he's talking about bringing it down to where he's living, to experience it. It's a dynamic power that operates in our life if we'll just choose Jesus that we might win him, to be found in him, and then to experience that power. Just stop and think for a moment that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That is awesome. Why do we live such low-level lives as Christians sometimes? When we can experience Christ in our life. Randy, I love that song that to choose Him. It's a choice. And we have to make it. It's honors to make. And so Paul says, I want a winning attitude. I want life to mean something. Let me tell you something about life. Your life is the most important commodity that you have. It's important. We only get to go through this life one time. Then it's over. We have to make right choices. And Paul is saying, let me give you a diagram. Let me give you some instructions here on how to have that trophy, to win Christ and to be found in him and to know him. The fourth thing, he says that I might follow after him. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. So the question here, what draws my attention the most for my allegiance? What is it out there that wants me to bow down to it? What is it out there that draws my attention? To follow means that there's something out front that's leading. In our modern day society, it could be technology out there leading us. Nothing wrong with technology, but I'm almost convinced that we've become so wrapped up and addicted to it that you know as well as I do. And it, you know, I used to go to the restaurant, my wife and I would leave, we'd see this couple sitting there, and they were just going like this all the time. And man, we'd say, I don't know how they could do that. I just don't know. You know, I, I just can't believe that people would take technology and just... And then the other day I was sitting there watching TV, and I was over here going like this, and my wife said, hey, 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 I'm talking to you. Oh, okay. I look over there, and she's going like this. And I think, you know, what are we following? What is it out here in front of us that's really leading us. We could go on and on and on. It could be some of the addictions that we have that we follow after those things. The Bible says, Jesus said unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We are following 
something. You turn on your news. People are following something. Whatever is dangling out there in front of them. The Apostle Paul said that I want Christ. I want to follow him because I know he's going in the right direction. And then the last point, the Apostle Paul said that I might press toward the mark. I might press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So then, the question is this, where is my energy employed in my daily life? Where's my energy going? Am I following after? Wrapped up in the word press, I press forward, is the word pressure. 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 It's pictured by the, the athlete running the race. Stretched out. Pressure. Pressing toward the mark. The Apostle Paul said, that's the way I'm going to live my life. I have all the other activity going on in my life, and there's nothing wrong with uh, most of the activity that we have. I know many of you, you've got children in little league, whatever it is, soccer, football, basketball, baseball. Boy, sometimes you just, you're just going all the time, aren't you? It really gets kind of old, and sometimes you get wore out. But those are, those are things that we do. But Paul said, the one thing that I do, the most important thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to press toward the mark of the high calling of God. Now, I think it's identifiable as to what that mark is. Now, if you read scholars, they will tell you, well, he's talking about heaven. I'm pressing toward that mark that someday I'm going to be ushered into heaven. And that is the mark that I'm shooting for. But I don't think that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about here. I think he's talking about something that can happen in his life today. I really believe the, the identifiable mark that he's talking about, and if you don't get anything else out of the message today, at least get this. I think that identifiable mark that Paul is pressing toward is a life, his life, that if he chooses to win Christ, to be found in him, and to know him and to follow him, it's a life that will develop him to the place that God wants him to be. God can do great things with our lives. It's a mark that we can be driving for. Yes, it's going to take pressure. Yes, you have to press toward it. Yes, you have to be moving. No, you can't be complacent. We have to be moving. But it's a mark to allow God to make us what God wants to make us. That's what he's talking about. That should be our desire. And of course, that is to become just like him. It's a great mark the Apostle Paul is talking about. I want to challenge you, not only individually, this year, to take this scripture that we just read today and to look at it. And I say, you know, I really want that for my life. I think starting a new year is a time that we can put everything in the past behind us and look for something new. I like what, how God operates. He gives us seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. We finish this, we start another one. Months, we go into new months, we go into a new year, new century, new millennium. Sun comes up, the sun goes down. God has a system that really helps us to live, live life. It's January the 1st. It's really a time to change and to head in a new direction. In the uh, deserts in America, there are two birds that fly in those deserts and other birds, but the two that I want to tell you about is the vulture and the hummingbird. The vulture 
hummingbird. The vulture comes into the desert, and he's looking for everything that's rotten, dead, stinks, gone, the past. He thrives upon that. That's what he looks for. That's where he lives. That's what he eats. There he is. The hummingbird, when he flies in, he flies right over that. Pays no attention to it. The hummingbird is looking for a blossom of one of the desert flowers. Something that's there now. Something that's alive. Something that's enjoyable. That's what the hummingbird is looking for. So, the vulture, looking for something that was gone and has passed. The hummingbird is looking for something that is alive, fresh, new, living now. Both birds get exactly what they're looking for. The vulture gets the rotten meat. The hummingbird gets the beautiful flower. We will get exactly what we're looking for in 2015. We can either look to the past, already over, it's done, it's finished, or we can look to the future, new, it's fresh, it's good, it's pleasant, it's our choice. Remember the song that Randy sang? I choose Jesus. Remember what the Apostle Paul said? That I might win him. That I might be found in him. That I might know him and follow him. And I'm going to press. One thing he said I do. He knew that life was so short, so small, that he couldn't go in all different directions in life. He had one thing I do. It was like a compass. He brought it there, said, there's north. I'm going to follow this one thing I do. So I want you to think about the new year. You think about it personally, but about our church. I believe God is ready to do some great and wonderful things at Glenville. All churches go through those times when we become complacent. Things aren't going like they should. Sometimes they don't go like we think they should. But I know this, that God has a plan for us. And I'm looking forward to 2015 at Glenville. And I'm looking forward for the two services to be full. You say, that can't happen. Why? Why? It won't happen if we're just looking at stuff that was of the past. <coughs> that which is gone. That which was. The only way it's going to happen is if we look to the future. We look to the beautiful blossoms in the desert. Something fresh. Something that is. And so I really pray that we will do that as a church. But I think sometimes that this is a time when we can really make some commitment. Fresh commitment. Fresh. When was the last time you made a fresh commitment for God? Or have you become addicted to what you already have? And I just don't need anything else. I'm, I'm satisfied with that and I'm complacent with it. That's all right. Or is there something else out there that you think, wow, there's some possibilities for me that God will have for my life. And so sometimes we need to make fresh commitments. Churches need to do that. People need to do that. And so I'm going to ask Justin to come. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And, and um, I'd just like to open the altars up here this morning. And if there's something that, you know, you, you're thinking about this is soon be January the 1st and you know, I really want my life to, to amount to something for next year. And I really want to serve God next year. And I really want to grow. I want something fresh in my life. And you live a year, 365 days, and there's a lot of freshness in that 365 days. But I know this, there's a lot of junk that passes through there too. And maybe today you would like to make a fresh commitment to Christ choice. The vulture gets what he wants and the hummingbird gets what he wants. They make that choice. And so please stand and I'm going to have a word of prayer. 
Maybe if God's speaking to your life this morning in some way and say, you know, I really need a fresh anointing of the Spirit of God upon my life. The fresh anointing of the Spirit of God. I'm dry. I'm empty. I need something different. I need something glory upon glory upon glory. Grace upon grace upon grace. Faith to faith to faith. I need to be moving. I just can't stay where I'm at. Heavenly Father, 